Uh, I know that it's, it's kind of difficult to make it to 6.30 on a weekday evening, but I appreciate y'all coming out here this evening to hear our draft policy, read through the draft policy with us, and then uh, give us some feedback as to your thoughts uh, regarding that policy. I'm going to pull a chair up. Before we get into the draft, I'd kind of like to talk about the, the initiative for de-escalation and kind of the history of how we got to this point and where we're going from here. So about a year ago in June of 2021, the previous chief, Chief uh, Deck Brown, pulled a team together and that team, a lot of that team is in here tonight. Uh, Lieutenant Lockhart, uh, Lieutenant Bornia, Sergeant Garten, Michael Ballin and myself, along with our fiscal service manager, uh, Don Myers, um, came together to look at a grant um, that was being offered by the Department of Justice and the COPS office. And it was for de-escalation. And we decided that we would like to apply for that grant, um, not knowing that we would get anything out of the grant. It was like, a, I think we might have had two or three weeks to put it together. Um, but we, we had an idea of what we wanted to do and it was in line with some of the direction that we'd been going. Uh, we, we knew that we wanted to create a standalone policy for de-escalation currently and up at that point, our de-escalation or the policies that dealt with de-escalation will be found in our use of force policy, which is 1108-1. And we wanted to kind of have a higher level use of force, not just to think about uh, our higher level de-escalation, not just thinking about de-escalation when there is an imminent use of force or potential use of force, but how do we set up a call? How do we respond? How do we communicate with someone even when there's no, um, no imminence of, of, of threat or violence or anything. How do we lead with de-escalation? So we knew we wanted to have a standalone policy. We also wanted to have a component of community engagement because we knew that there would be a, a community expectation uh, for the police department. So it's better to hear on the front end rather than the back end as to what that, that, that expectation is and to get the input into what you think should be in, in such a policy. And then the last component, uh, for de-escalation had to do with training. And we knew that there would be a component of training for our staff, for sworn and some of the non-sworn uh, staff that have uh, public engagement. So we, we proceeded uh, with that application and in the fall of last year, we, we received uh, or were awarded the grant. And that award came out to about $118,000. And I guess in the scheme of, of government grants, that's not a lot of money, but that's, that's good money. That's, that's $118,000 for us to, to look to training and some contractual services. Um, that's a reimbursement type grant. So whenever we have an expenditure, we need to spend some money, we would tell the, the cop's office, this is what we intend to spend the money on. They say, that's allowed. We make the purchase or spend the money and then we receipt uh, we give that receipt to the DOJ COPS office and then they reimburse us for the money. So that's kind of the way that it works. Uh, we, we looked at several trainings as part of that grant for like train the trainer courses. So part of that was our ACORN. So Lieutenant Lockhart is in charge of our ACORNS unit and her unit specifically has received some, some training and will receive more training uh, that relates to de-escalation and um, nonviolent crisis intervention, things like that. So, like I mentioned, training, community engagement, and policy development are the three prongs of this initiative. Tonight, we're gonna to handle two of them. It's gonna be community engagement, and we're gonna go through this draft policy. So what I'll do is I'll read through the entire policy, and then after that, I'll ask section by section, are there any recommendations or any suggestions on this point? And then we'll proceed through the policy, and then when we get done with that, Inevitably, there's always somebody that says, oh, you know what, I got one more thing about. So we'll, after we go through each section, we'll just come back and say, is there anything about any of it so that we're getting the feedback? And I'll be recording that feedback at that time. So with that being said, let's go ahead and start with the policy. So I'm going to start actually on, on that cover page and read through this because this actually means something. So. The cover page starts the top of the page are the department values. Those are service, courage, fairness, integrity, 
and compassion. And then the Raleigh Police Department de-escalation policy, and you'll see it's 11XX-XX. Those X's just represent this is a draft policy. It's not been uh, approved. It does not have a number designation yet, but upon approval, it will have a number designation. So the purpose of the policy is to define the process of de-escalation and provide guidelines for the exercise of de-escalation techniques and tactics to increase the likelihood of voluntary compliance by a subject. The values reflected. This directive reflects the RPD values of fairness, service, integrity, courage, and compassion. By following the guidelines presented in the following directives, department personnel demonstrate our commitment to the well-being of every individual we encounter. Units affected, all divisions, all personnel. Then the references and forms, North Carolina General Statute 15A-401D on the use of force and arrest, Department Operating Instructions, DOI 1108-1, use of force and weapons, DOI 1108-3, prisoners and restraints, DOI 1105-3, officer-involved shootings and in-custody deaths, DOI 1109-12, interacting with vulnerable populations, and then the training materials will be determined as that training curriculum is uh, developed and finalized. For the policies that were referenced in this section, those are all available online. Uh, you can find those online at the address that is on the bottom of the agenda. And that is on the bottom of your agenda. I have my agenda with me. It is RaleighNC.gov, and then it's the, the address again at the bottom of the agenda. I, I don't have it memorized. It's a long one. Yes, policy-procedures slash safe, uh, excuse me. Yes. I want to make sure I get this on audio. Uh, Jay is recording this so in, in case anybody's listening. Uh, it is RaleighNC.gov slash safety slash slash police dash policies dash and dash procedures. The easy way is if you go to the RaleighNC.gov website and just put in police policy, it'll take you right to it. Okay, so the next page, general policies. The Raleigh Police Department affirms the sanctity of life and seeks to preserve and improve quality of life as it carries out its mission and service to the community. Employees are often faced with challenging, dynamic, and evolving situations. Employees require training and equipment to effectively and strategically slow down those situations in a manner that allows more time, distance, space, and tactical flexibility to bring about a safe resolution, maintain public trust, and reflect organizational values. Employees are empowered to utilize all available resources as these situations are often a result of extraordinary challenges being faced by those involved. The process of de-escalation may minimize the likelihood that an employee uses physical force beyond touch during an incident. It may also increase the likelihood of voluntary compliance and or decrease the amount of force that may be needed. During a force encounter, officers must constantly evaluate the threat posed by the individual in the level of force being used by the officer. This may mean decreasing or increasing the level of force during an encounter as necessary, depending on the totality of factors facing the officers. The employment of de-escalation techniques is especially important to maintain safety of all during encounters with children, youth, and persons experiencing a behavioral, health, or situational crisis. Definitions. De-escalation is defined as taking action or communicating verbally or non-verbally prior to or during a potential force encounter in an attempt to stabilize the situation and reduce the immediacy of the threat so that more time, options, and resources can be called upon to resolve the situation without the use of force or with a reduction in the force necessary. De-escalation is a process that may include, but is not limited to, the use of such techniques as presence, verbal commands, warnings, verbal persuasion, and tactical repositioning. De-escalation and use of force. 
de-escalation techniques. Whenever feasible, prior to using physical force, officers must use de-escalation techniques in an attempt to gain voluntary compliance and reduce or avoid the need for force. De-escalation tactics should be used when time and the totality of circumstances allow for them to be deployed, i.e. when the officer or others are not in imminent physical danger. Whenever possible, and when such delay will not unreasonably compromise the safety of the officer or other individuals, result in the destruction of evidence, escape of a suspect, or commission of a crime, officers shall allow an individual time and opportunity to submit to verbal commands before force is used. Totality of circumstances. On page three. When time and circumstances reasonably permit an officer or officers shall consider whether a subject's lack of compliance is a deliberate attempt to resist or is the result of an inability to comply based on factors including, but not limited to, medical conditions, mental impairment, developmental disability, physical limitation, language barrier, drug interaction, behavioral crisis an employee's awareness of all factors that may influence a lack of compliance should be balanced against the facts of the incident and which techniques are the most appropriate to bring the situation to a safe resolution. Supervisor roles. The role of the supervisor during difficult, dynamic, challenging, and evolving situations is critical to ensure the safety of all parties involved, compliance with applicable policies, and accountability. Supervisors shall ensure an appropriate number of personnel are engaged in an incident and should also be actively assessing tactical positioning and or deployment of specialized equipment. At an appropriate time and when it is feasible to do so, supervisors should provide timely and constructive feedback directly to the employee, assess whether personnel successfully employed de-escalation techniques during a use of force review. Refer the employee to further training and consultation with training staff if deficiencies are noted. This policy, excuse me, training. This policy will be reviewed annually based on the North Carolina Education and Training Standards mandates and or departmental training needs. And that concludes the draft policy. I want to give you a few minutes to kind of process that, look back over that, and then think of recommendations and we're going to start at the start and go all the way through. Yes? Where do you find these mandated policies? I mean, I'm not sure So, commission's mandates? Okay. Uh, the tra North Carolina? Okay, yes. Do you know, is that the North Carolina Training Commission? Okay, so the North Carolina Training and Standards Commission website will have those mandates. Okay. That, uh, so she was asking about the, man, the, the training okay, mandates from okay. the state. So the policies will be on that. The training mandates would be on the state, uh, on the state's website. Okay. okay. So I'm going to give you a moment to look over the policy and, again, to process that. Uh, and then we'll get started with with your recommendations and suggestions after.
So we'll go ahead and get started. It's on the first page where we have uh, the purpose, the values, the units affected, and the reference forms. Any recommendations or suggestions on this page? So uh, there's, there's no way to answer that properly because you're referring to escalation without provocation or escalation without cause. We're trying to avoid escalation without cause. Yes. And through, through training, through policy, through accountability, by having that in our culture, that we are not escalating without cause. Yes. See, yes. See, the issue is how you fix it if you don't change the culture of the ones who are who have the responsibility to speak in the first place. Because we, my, my point is this: the problem will completely go away if they police the black community the way they police the white community. We wouldn't have an issue if that was the case. But there is a difference in how you fix the issue when it's a, it, when it's really a psychological issue in how they.
If, and I'm sorry, if, if I can kind of get this back to the policy, because I can see that this is going to go to an issues conversation, and I've got about 29 minutes to make it to this policy, and then we can talk afterwards. But I would like to say, to validate what you're, what, what you're saying, when you said that policing is different in a black neighborhood than it is in a white neighborhood, nobody asked you what you meant by it. Okay, so I know, I know, what you're, I know exactly what you're saying. We're in agreement in what we want in the outcome. We, we want people to be treated like people, plain and simple. That's the, the first line of the, the policy on, on the next page is what you're saying is what we're trying to say. So we want to lay out the expectations for our officers so that we're doing and having that culture to get to exactly what you're saying, that we're not unjustly escalating. Okay, so we are in agreement there. Before we get into questions, I need to ask specifically just Yes or no, if there's any recommendations or suggestions about this cover page, some of the meetings there haven't been, some there have been. Yes, ma'am. I think it's really going to be helpful if someone covered what you perceive to be MC. Are we talking about the first page or the whole, the whole pop? Okay, on the first page, what would you like to add, ma'am? Uh, okay, on, on, on this. So again, this is a policy. This isn't a proce procedure. Yes. So for the purpose, on the purpose of the policy, is there a recommendation or a suggestion that you have for us to add or change? A specific recommendation that you would like to make toward the purpose? That's okay.
Anything else on this, this first page? I'm going to turn over to now to page two that begins with general policies. And I'm only asking right now about the section on general policies, the first half of the page. Any, any recommendations for change, any suggestions for addition, suggestions for removal for general policy section? Any recommendations or for changes or edits in this section right here, the section called general policies? Yes. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. When does that unit, A form, come into play? Again. So I'm, I'm a supervisor over A form. Okay. The tenant unit. And so as part of this, the grant process, we have actually gone through the planning center mm -hmm. um, and we're going to be actually planning, planning, monitoring, hopefully we're going to alert them to whatever building is built to operate. Um, but as far as the escalation in the policy, what we're trying to create is a policy that needs to be accessible to everyone, any and all personnel. Yeah. And that includes a form yeah. and civilian yeah. personnel as well in this in this policy. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the officer should not escalate? They should not be promoting or escalating in situations because they're not going to be able to do that. Where, Eric? Yes, ma'am. Where is it? Um, I'm just thinking when an officer gets to the point that he feels like he needs to remove himself because he cannot bring himself back. Uh, they'll, they'll back down. Right. So, so part of de-escalation, and, and that's going to come in the, in the within training curriculum. Okay. So there's an aspect of emotional intelligence that comes with this. Okay. Um, and, and so that whenever we're needing to de-escalate uh, another person, whenever we're needing to de-escalate a situation, we're going to we have to remind ourselves that we have to de-escalate ourselves mm -hmm. because adrenaline flows. We're human beings, and the natural reaction to tension is tension. So as we're trying to de-escalate the situation, we want to de-escalate. If we find that I'm having difficulty doing that, we do train, switch out. So if Sergeant Garton sees that I need to de-escalate and I'm having a hard time de-escalating de myself, he can say, hey, I've got this and tap me out, okay? Or I can, if I recognize it myself, I can say, hey, can, can you handle this? And upon that recognition, he can step in. And a lot of times, in my experience, there, um, in incidents, there are certain police officers that folks find easier to talk to, and, and sometimes, you know, others they don't. You go to the very next call, and it flips, you know, uh, so for, for whatever reason. But yes, that is something that would be part of training curriculum is that, that switching out or recognition that I'm up here and I need to be down here, so having someone else come in to, to assist. It also falls under that duty to intervene. Sergeant. Yes. Thank you. 
question I have is about acorn. Um, I've been seeing different situations about it. You said in the winter, acorn leaves don't come in enough. Maybe they can talk to it, do it, cut it up or whatever. Yeah. You know. Well, additional resource that we have are on, are on the two by two ends. So the property is going to continue to turn it all over. So that's another resource. I mean, you may not necessarily know that those officers mm -hmm. are there, although they have a little bit button that they wear. But you may not know because they're still uniformed officers. But they're part of the team, too. OK, one more question. Um, the last couple incidents, um, were they on the scene? Yes, sir. I'm a father too. Yes, sir. I have a, a son and a daughter. Um, a couple of years ago, we could have reported it. We had some events that were at risk, and I was going to find out the paramedics to respond. My wife and I were at risk. Um, we had a couple of things at the house. Wasn't some bottles in the backyard. Get on the hood and start walking down the street with a tool. Was one of the neighbors called the police, and uh, thank God that they didn't use big handguns, but they sprayed pepper spray and got him to the court ambulance and got him to the court. Long story short. Thank you for thanks for sharing sharing that with. I'm sorry, ma'am. Yes. That is, so that refers to every, every bit of equipment, every tool that has been issued or is available. That is a, that is a long list of, of, of tools. Um, can you be more specific? That's not, no, 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 no. Then how no. does the tool, what tool is going to be excavated in this situation? Right, so, so, so the tools that are used and the, the techniques that are used are based on the totality of the circumstances, all the articulable factors, the totality of the circumstances of the incident that is, that is going on, um, the, and, you know, the level of resistance, the, the, the level of threat to, to others, to the officer, um, to, the to the officer or to others? Well, what about the officers doing the other thing? No, I, yes, ma'am. So, so, so I, I'm, so I can't. I understand what you're saying, but we're not writing a policy to justify bad action. Okay. We're saying we're not tolerating bad action. Okay. So we don't write a de-escalation policy to say um, officers act inappropriately. This is. Th that's an other policy. That's in, that's in discipline policy. We, we have d a discipline process. What we're trying to do is set aside that there's, a, there's an expectation for de-escalation, okay? 
and that we use whatever tools that we have available or should have avail available, reasonably have available that are reasonably appropriate to handle the incident based on the totality of the circumstances in the course of that incident. Um, and, and we can't put out an exhaustive list because that, that changes uh, very frequently. Mental health, first aid, I think oh, we did yeah. we did have that for the public. I don't know of anyone's right now, but that is something we can revisit. I'm sorry, what? Saying that's something we could revisit. I'm not aware of any mental aid, first aid trainings that we have done for the public recently or that we have planned in the very near future. But they, they were I, I do remember that, yes. And that's something that we can revisit. I was trying to get them to apply and I can't find any. Yes, okay. But we'll talk after this. Yes. Okay. All right. For uh, the section called definition or definitions, any recommendations or suggestions for definitions? Okay. For de escalation and use of force, de escalation techniques, the bottom of page two to the top of page three. Any recommendations or suggestions for that section? Yes, so, so we have touched on that in training that's already been presented to the department in peer intervention. Um, so th they are primed for that. Okay. Yes, yes sir. Yes. 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 And otherwise, you should include what are, what, what are the situations right. where it wouldn't be reasonable. So at the bottom of that paragraph, and we're talking about that first paragraph under de-escalation techniques, uh, the, the point was, why is the, the first two words, whenever feasible, there? And then what are the situations where it might not be feasible? Is that, did I capture that correctly, sir? Yes. Yes. So, so if if we state prior to using physical force, officers must use de-escalation techniques. That is not feasible in every situation. There are many situations where that is not, where that would not be appropriate or right. Uh, so that that bottom, the end of that paragraph where it says in the parentheses, i.e., when the officer or others are not in imminent physical danger. If we respond to an active shooter and someone is actively shooting a school, we are not at that point doing de-escalation techniques. We are addressing the situation. If we do not have whenever feasible in this policy, then we will be telling those officers, we want, before you address the person that is shooting people, we want you to try to de-escalate verbally or non-verbally. That would not be correct or appropriate. So that's, that's why that is that is in the policy in that, that sense. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, though. Yeah, yes. So you would like some more clarity in that section, perhaps? I think instead of saying whenever feasible, you basically um, say what you just said. Look, if possible, we will de escalate. But if it's not possible, it's not possible. Can you make a reason for it if that is actually the case? You're basically stating that if it's feasible, we do it. If it's not, we won't. So when it's feasible, it's whenever it's feasible, right. which is, which is right. that's so, what I said. Yes, sir. And, and our, our, our personnel that would be accountable to this understand that if there's not a de an attempt at de-escalation, there needs to be a positive um, 
there, there needs to be articulable factors that they need to be able to speak clearly as to why they did not de-escalate because this person was swinging a baseball bat at somebody at this time and I, I didn't have time. I had to intervene and, and stop the assault, something, something like that. But, but I, I've got that written down, sir. I understand. Okay. So uh, moving on, I've got about 10 minutes. Michael Ballin's about to tell me I've got about 10 minutes. Um, so I guess we're at supervisor roles on page three. Any recommendations, suggestions for supervisor roles? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. so where, where we address that currently is in our peer intervention policy and within our peer intervention tra training. So I'm a lieutenant with the police department, an officer that just gets out of the academy and is on field training. If I'm in a position to where I'm escalating the situation, where I'm making the situation worse, where I'm about to use force, perhaps where that is neither reasonable nor necessary, that brand new officer has the authority to tap me out, to, to intervene the, resp the, the positive responsibility. Yes, thank you, Billy. Yes. So would it be beneficial to use the word peer intervention in your policy? Sergeant Coffee. That, that, that has to be important. Yes, yes. My question is, we talked about supervisor roles, but how often is the supervisor on site? Right. So <clears throat> not every time, right? Not every time. However, as uh, many of the situations that are alluded to in here uh, that would require multiple resources, multiple officers on the scene would also require a supervisor to get to the scene. That does not guarantee that a supervisor is on scene at the time or they might still be in route. So that's why in um, bullet point two under supervisor role, assess whether personnel successfully employed de-escalation techniques during a use of force review. So if a, if a use of force occurs prior to supervisor getting on scene. That supervisor is going to review the, the use of force report. They're going to review the body worn camera footage. They're going to speak with and, and determine what took place. So then they address that as a supervisor after the fact. Now, obviously, uh, um, in the first part of that paragraph where it talks about uh, the supervisor roles to ensure appropriate number of personnel the appropriate tactical positioning or deployment of specialized equipment, that would require the supervisor to be on scene. That's an expectation when they are on scene. Okay. Eric. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've noticed that you all have uh, spoke a lot about or uh, referring back to the use of force policy. Yes. Would it be feasible to add that into this draft to say, you can refer to our use of force policy. Yes, 
So, so internally, we, we recognize that. So on the very first page where it says the references. Okay. So when an officer, when a person from the police department is going to read policy, and we, this is the very first thing that we see, and we go, okay, this is going to address. So that's, that first policy that's listed under North Carolina General Statute, it goes to DOI 1108-1. That tells us to refer okay. to that policy. So you're exactly right that we should do that. That's the shorthand for that for us. Okay. So that might not be explicit, but that is, that, that is the shorthand for us. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I'm just standing here in my life. Okay, all the officers rush to a scene. Who listens to who? Who do, who do you listen to? Right. So, so that's your question. Okay. So a couple of things there, right? So it could be the ranking officer. It could be the officer. Usually, usually the first officer on scene has the most information. So they are generally the ones that's, that are kind of delegating out. They are the incident commander per se um, until someone of higher authority gets there. Okay. That's generally the way that flows. However, um, if I'm three days off training and I'm just getting it together and this is a pretty serious thing and Sergeant Garden is the officer with a, with a lot more experience than me and he's the second person, there's a time where he might take that up. Okay, good question. Thank you. All right, so the last point is uh, this area of training. Any questions, concerns, comments? Thank you, Michael. About training? Okay. How often do they train? Okay, so, so training, how often do we train? We train all, all the time. Sometimes it feels like all the, all the time. Uh, <laughs> So, so the, we have state mandated training. We have city, uh, we have departmental training okay. in addition to that. And then there's other elective trainings that we may go to or that may be brought to, uh, to depart or offer by the department. Uh, do, you, do you have a count? I know 42 hours is like a minimum. Thank you. Yes, sir. Right. So, so I don't know that we'd put a dollar. I don't know that we put a dollar sign on it because it doesn't really work enough. But, but on time, of time. Yes, sir. So, so I don't have a way right now to quantify the percentage of time or the budget that goes toward that. But what I can say is that we are looking to do standalone de-escalation training. That's part of it. But then we're also incorporating that in scenario-based training so that then we'll have additional training so that um, aspects, certain aspects of de-escalation could be taught within um, the, the scenario-based style, style training so that it is uh, reiterated. Next week.
people are going to start training on de-escalation. Now, we've been training on de-escalation uh, yeah. for a long time, and it's part of youth sport. It's part of training. It's part of practice training. It's part of stuff. It's part of our in-service training. It's in the fabric of everything that we do. Uh, we just haven't had anyone who said this is de-escalation training. The rest of the jobs are training. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Right. But if it's independent self training where they have to go and do some modules, right. who's checking that they right. Yes, ma'am. So that's not how we're, we're doing de escalation training. This will be in person training. Uh, we're looking at about an eight hour block of training where they'll come in. Um, it will be lecture. We're looking at um, practical aspects, you know, where they have to engage and, and, and um, be a part of the training. And then again, after that eight hour block, at a future date, additional training where they're coming in and undergoing scenario-based training, where they might actually be driving a vehicle, you know, in a, in a controlled environment. There might be a, in a um, replicating a traffic stop or some other type of call for service, and there would be role players, and they have to demonstrate the proficiency in de-escalation techniques. And then you have it like firing off on the final yes. page. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm looking at 731. Okay. So, so what I'd like to do is um, just kind of give an opportunity for anything at large, um, any other any other suggestions, anything that is um, needed for the good of the group or for the good of this policy. What What is the next step? Yes. Thank you. All right, so the next step that we're looking at is uh, this summer we're finalizing the policy and the training curriculum. So we're, this is the last of the community engagement meetings. We're taking that information that we received. We're going to synthesize that, and we're going to update the draft, have a final policy, and send it for approval, and then it's finalized. Simultaneously, we'll be um, sending up a curriculum for approval so that in the fall, uh, we would like to come back and share late late summer, early fall. Come back and share. This is the policy uh, that we created for de-escalation, and and talk about how uh, the community input has impacted that. Uh, and then also have a little bit of a listening session there as well, because that policy will be reviewed annually. And and know that yes, come the fall, we're going to have that de-escalation policy in place. It'll no longer be a draft. It will be the policy. We'll be able to give that to you and you can take it home. The draft we got to take back up because it's not set in stone. It is, we, we're trying to avoid confusion uh, at a future date because that's not policy. The policy will come later. Um, but we still want to hear your voice because again, as we review that annually, we will be able to make updates uh, to the policy as needed. Okay. Uh, that's basically the, the timeline uh, moving forward. Yes, ma'am. So the approval of policy is, uh, you know, it goes up to the chief, runs up the chain of command to the chief of police, and then goes to the city manager for approval. Yeah. Okay. So, so with that, what I'll say is, I'm going to be around for a bit. Um, I'll be stacking up some chairs uh, in a little bit, but I'm going to be around. If you have questions, concerns, comments, things that I uh, didn't get uh, shared, or, or um, maybe just some questions you didn't know exactly how you want to articulate, but you want to get them out, I'm going to be here for a bit, and I'd love to hear what you, ha what you have to say. If there's nothing else, thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, the input that we've received in these meetings has been very, very helpful to us, and we're looking forward to uh, updating this draft to have a working policy.